I hope everyone is getting well by the grace of Almighty Allah. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. A wonderful day all of you. Welcome to our institution of Global Professional Free Webinar. Thank you. Thank you all for joining with us in this session. My lovely audience, today I am your host. I am Kamrul, coordinator of IGP from Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to be associated with IGP as a global member. And I feel honored to host this webinar and it's my delight to welcome you all to our institution of global professional free webinar. Once again, thank you again all for joining with, the, with us in this session. Dear participants, before we have completed our 737 webinar successfully. Today I will be presenting webinar number 738 and the to topic is Feminist Standpoint to Theory. Before studying the program, I remind you again, don't forget to share, take comments and mention your friends in the comment box because your attention encourages us to do better and best service to our lovely audience. Our mission is to empower our youth. So stay with us by your support. Today we have a speaker from India. Today our speaker name is Dr. Bhushan Sharma. She is the author, independent research PhD, Srimata Vishnu Devi University from India. Let's welcome our speaker to the screen. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon. A very good afternoon. Very warm greetings to you all. And welcome to my today's session on Feminist Standpoint Theory at Institute of Global Professionals. So before I begin with my session, I would like to share my PPT with you. Yes, ma'am. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Just bear with me. Uh, let me put it to the slideshow. Yes, ma'am. It's perfect it now. Mine? You can. Yes, ma'am. It's perfect now. You can start your presentation. Okay. Uh, again, a very warm welcome. I began with my session, Feminist Standpoint Theory. And highlights of today's session are background, then what is a standpoint, origin of the feminist standpoint theory, the feminist standpoint theory concepts, controversies of the theory, then the feminist standpoint theory reader and the select theorists, then discussion from the book, The Outsiders Within a Dalit Feminist Standpoint in the Life Narratives of Dalit Women. Then references for further reading. Background to my study is dominance, uh, social power abuse. That has always been the problem of humanity that results in social inequality, creating binaries that empower one group and marginalizes the other. Binaries are social constructs composed of two parts that are framed as absolute and unchanging opposites. For example, white and black, masculine and feminine, rich and poor, dominant and dominated, center and margin. Binary systems reflect the integration of these oppositional ideas into our culture. This results in an exaggeration of differences between social groups until they seem to have nothing in common. So these form the opposite groups. Men and women are the most common binary or social construction that divides people into two major opposition groups. 
men are dominant and socially privileged they have social power social power is defined as control exercised by one group over the actions or the minds of another group thus limiting the freedom of their work or expression the world is viewed and represented by men they had been the prime producers of knowledge which is androcentric or ma- men centered therefore the world view of men is a discourse of power and the dominant discourse is reiterated circulated and naturalized by those in power as a result it becomes the mainstream and the accepted way of looking at things and subjects women form the mutest group the muted group they are subdued repressed and marginalized from the discourse the muted group theory and its response edwin erdner introduced the muted group theory that was fully developed by shirley erdner in the edited volume perceiving women erdner in 1975 notices that women as a social group form about half of the population that has been neglected in social anthropological studies most of the researchers contributing to the study of ethnography leave out the perspectives of subdued group members particularly women and have been collecting data from adult males only the researchers use this incomplete data collected from fraction of the society that is only males to represent the culture as a whole as a result it produces fragmentary distorted partial incomplete view of society in the androcentric accounts crucial questions remain inexplicable says harding questions like what makes the women other why is violence against women practiced in every community class and race which social practices and processes do propagate and make acceptable the belief that men that women do not contribute to society community or social movements why women's life choices are so limited or restricted as most of them they are restricted to the household work Chris Kramer a proponent of muted group theory proclaims men and women perceive or they observe the world differently they view the world differently because their perception of life is shaped by their lived experiences which are different owing to the gendered division of labor thus their voice matters and their perspectives are significant in knowing the culture and society as a whole what is standpoint and standpoint theory the establishment of standpoint is the political achievement of those whose social location forms its starting point that is who are socially marginalized subdued or oppressed a social theory arguing that group location in hierarchical power relations produces common challenges for individuals in those groups moreover shared experiences can foster similar angles of vision leading to group knowledge or standpoint deemed essential for informed political action states collins thus standpoint theory argues that knowledge stems from social position a standpoint is an achieved collective identity or consciousness and is earned through the experience of collective political struggle it is not given but achieved through struggle so while both the dominant and the dominated occupy perspectives the dominated or oppressed are much more successfully placed to achieve a standpoint because of their collective political struggle because of which they gain subjugated uh, or alternative knowledge of the society those who are privileged with respect to their social positions are likely to be privileged with respect to gaining knowledge of the social reality collective perspectives produce the starting point for emergence of a 
standpoint, marginalized individuals have their unique view of the society as they have distinctive lived experience that shape their perspectives and they see things differently. Hence, marginality, which has been traditionally a space of repression and deprivation, is a source of new epistemology for standpoint theorists. Why is standpoint theory important? Standpoint theory gives voice to the marginalized and empowers them, challenges the status quo, representing the dominant position of privilege. It creates new epistemology, epistemology that is standards used to access knowledge, uncovers suppressed truths, corrects the falsehoods, or the propaganda we can even call, transforms society and rewrites history. Origin of the feminist standpoint theory. Feminist standpoint theory emerged in the 1970s and 1980s and theorists extended and reframed the idea of standpoint of proletariat to mark out the logical space for a feminist standpoint. Feminist standpoint theory originates in Hegel's thinking about the relationship between the master and the slave. Thus, master-slave dialectic argues that the slave or the oppressed can eventually reach a state of freedom through consciousness gained by a continuous struggle against the master. Nancy Hatsock is frequently credited with introducing the idea of a feminist standpoint arguing that position of the proletariat is analogous to that of women in patriarchal society. Hartsock finds in Marx a means to identify and ground a feminist epistemology. Just as the proletariat is able to go beneath bourgeoisie ideology, Hartsock argues can a reflective approach to women's labor yield insights into both why patriarchal institutions and ideologies take such perverse and deadly forms and how both theory and practice can be redirected in more liberatory directions. Although Hatsok ultimately argues that Marxist conception of production fails to account for women's labor satisfactorily. Thus, there are at least three schools in the development of feminist standpoint theory the original Marxist analysis, a second approach criticizes the Marxist approach as primarily gender neutral. A third approach proposes as we adopt the notion of situated knowledges. Then uh, concepts of feminist standpoint theory. Feminist standpoint is a feminist theoretical perspective that argues that knowledge stems from social position. The theory suggests that research and theory have ignored and marginalized women and feminist ways of thinking or feminist knowledge. The theory is also known as feminist standpoint epistemology. It has been presented as a way of empowering women, valuing their expressions and developing an oppositional consciousness. The term was coined by Sandra G. Harding, an American philosopher and a renowned feminist theorist to categorize epistemologies that emphasize women's knowledge. The principal claim regarding feminist standpoint theories is that certain sociopolitical positions occupied by women can become sites of epistemic privilege and thus productive starting points for inquiry into questions about not only women, also about men and the society as a whole. This claim is captured by Sandra Harding. Starting of research from women's lives will generate less partial and distorted accounts, not only of women's lives, but also of men's lives and the whole social order. She argued that it is because for those at the top of social hierarchies, to lose sight of real human relations and the true nature of social reality and thus miss critical questions about 
the social and natural world in their academic pursuits. In contrast, people at the bottom of social hierarchies have a unique standpoint that is a better starting point for scholarship. Although such people are often ignored, their marginalized positions actually make it easier for them to define important research questions and explain social and natural problems. The idea of the standpoint has been reconstructed and outlined by feminist theorists and has been advanced from time to time, thus developing the theory into an extensive categorization that embraces somewhat diverse methods. So there is uh, uh, no single method. In fact, there are diverse methods to situate or to construct, to create a feminist standpoint. Stretching from Donna Haraway's analysis of situated knowledges, Nancy Hatsock, feminist historical materialistic perspective, Patricia Hill Collins, the black feminist thought, Dorothy E. Smith's everyday world sociology for women and many more. Contesting that the world appears and is viewed differently through the perspective of, of women and their unique lived experience. The experiences of the oppressed groups may become an important source of critical insight, states Colin. Therefore, the lived experience of women can provide useful starting points for inquiry into issues, matters, or problems about not only women, but of the political system and the whole society. Hence, feminist standpoint theorists aim to evaluate the dominant worldview by assessing or valuing the everyday lived experience of women the second sex, the largest muted, oppressed, and marginalized group. Controversies of the feminist standpoint theory. Feminist standpoint theory had been the most debatable and controversial. The prime controversy is of false universalism, since feminist standpoint theorists argue that inquiry is best started from women's lives and that standpoints emerge only when women begin to reflect upon and question the reality of those lives through a politicized framework. Feminist standpoint theories can also be misunderstood as proposing a single monolithic feminist standpoint. This misunderstanding presents the feminist standpoint as arising not from ordinary women's lives, but from the lives of relatively privileged, mostly middle class, mostly white women academics. Till now, most of the theory uh, has uh, come up from white feminist, Western feminist, upper middle class women. On the contrary, feminist standpoint theories are clearly not committed to the project of formulating a homogeneous women's or feminist standpoint. Rather, they recognize that women's presence in many areas of terrain of social and economic marginalization means that women occupy positions at the intersection of a number of oppressive social structures. Thus, contemporary feminist theory has focused on incorpor incorporating considerations of difference within feminist standpoint theories. The theory aims to acknowledge the diversity of women by welcoming the views of other oppressed groups of women. So, feminist standpoint theory that favors diverse standpoints from different women who come from intersectional backgrounds, who undergo intersectional operations. However, reconciliation between feminist standpoint theories and those feminist theories which prioritize difference remains problematic and presents a dilemma. The formation of a standpoint requires shared experiences of operation and of struggle against that operation. But the inclusion of those experiences within a standpoint, it can be argued, runs the risk of occluding epistemically significant differences between women. It can be uh, a problem that the dominant groups of the feminist, they may 
dominate again in the feminist discourse. A feminist standpoint may be taken as the position of all women, but what account is taken of class, race, sexuality and other markers of difference? which structure the power relations that generate operation, the shared experience of which forms the basis of standpoint. The response to this dilemma from within standpoint theory has been firstly to emphasize that feminist standpoint theories envisage a plurality of feminist standpoints. There are plural. There are number of feminist standpoints and secondly to modify feminist standpoint theories to take account of the ways in which women's different experiences at the intersections of various oppressive social structures will engender different standpoints. For example, Patricia Hill Collins and Bell Hooks have developed black feminist standpoint theories that take into account the role of women of color in slavery and in devalued menial and caring labor and the way in which this operation is experienced at the hands of other mostly white women and the second controversy is epistemic relativism epistemic relativism is the position that knowledge is valid only relatively to a specific context society culture individual the knowledge which holds good for the Western theorists, it may not be applicable to uh, third world women. The charge that feminist standpoint epistemologies are committed to a politically dangerous epistemic relativism ensues from the claim that all knowledge is socially situated and that some social values enhance the process of inquiry and the acquisition of knowledge. In response to this, charge, Sandra Harding reconceptualizes objectivity, arguing for pursuit of strong objectivity. Harding argues that standpoint theory imposes a rigorous logic of discovery involving a strong demand for ongoing reflection and self-critique from within a standpoint, enabling the justification of socially situated claims. That is, each group should prepare their own knowledge, their own perspectives, their own standpoint. This critical approach, Harding asserts, results in a stronger notion of objectivity than that achieved by traditional approaches of inquiry. The traditional starting point for knowledge is the position of dominant, despite assumptions to the contrary that position is ideologically permeated. This results in partial and distorted accounts of reality, which thereby fail to live up to the modernistic standards of impartiality, neutrality, and universality associated with the commitment to epistemic objectivity. By these lights, feminist standpoint theories remain committed to strengthening modernist commitments to truth and objectivity. Strong objectivity encompass a sense of completeness and lack of distortion. The ultimate epistemic goal of inquiry based on this model would be the inclusion of all standpoints, enabling the revelation of different aspects of truth. So feminist standpoint theory that includes all diverse standpoints from diverse groups of women so that it enables the uh, revelation uh, of new aspects of truth. It generates new knowledge, new epistemology. For example, Uma Narayan, a feminist theorist from India, claims that women have held a different type of knowledge. Women are diverse and have varied lives and roles in almost all communities that are significantly different from those of their men. Their location as a subordinate group and their lived experience in different cultures and communities allow women to see and understand the world in ways that are different and challenging to the prevailing male-biased conventional wisdom. Therefore, feminist standpoint theory has continued to attract both enthusiasts and critics during the decades of its recent history. Tensions within and between its texts still generate lively debates in feminist circles, and that adds to 
the feminist standpoint theory. Standpoint theory is valuable in many ways as it defenders as its defenders argue, Harding proposes that this universality in, is another valuable response that standpoint theory contributes to feminism as well as to contemporary scientific, philosophic, and political dimensions from generally, more generally. Standpoint theory innovations bring into focus fresh perspectives. For example, Bhushan Sharma's recent book, The Outsiders Within, a Dalit feminist standpoint in the life narratives of Dalit women adds to new perspectives uh, to the feminist theory. The feminist standpoint, Theory Reader, a volume edited by Sandra G. Harding, an American feminist theorist, the main canonizing force behind prioritizing thinking from women's perspective and the prime force behind the feminist standpoint theory. Feminism and the women's movement provide the theory and motivation for inquiry and political struggle that can transform the perspective of women into a standpoint, a morally and scientifically preferable grounding for our interpretations and explanations of nature and social life, states Harding. Harding's proposal for the feminist standpoint argues that men's dominating position in social life results in perverse and partial understandings, whereas women's subdued positions provide the possibility of inclusive understandings and alternative knowledge. Their continuous struggle generates collective consciousness. Women's lived experiences of marginality and subjugation make them struggle and conscious of their state, which shapes their perspective. Subjugated standpoints are preferred because they seem to promise more adequate, objective, and transforming accounts of the world. The social location of marginalized groups make it more possible for them to be aware of the social reality and research, which predominantly focuses on power relations should commence with the lives of the marginalized. Harding argues that experiences of the marginalized disclose underlying problems to be explained, which the dominant groups are not able to recognize. The problems that can become research agendas and raise questions to examine the ways of social life, social structure, bigotry of the dominant social groups and the position that has previously counted as knowledge. Harding also interrogates if women's social experiences is divided by class, race and culture, can there be a feminist standpoint? Hence, she presents a broad spectrum of feminist research in her edited volume, The Feminist Standpoint Theory Reader, Intellectual and Political Controversies, which is the most influential book on the highly controversial standpoint theory. It is the first anthology to bring together the most significant 28 essays on standpoint theory by the foremost feminist scholars and theorists. The essays are grouped under four sections. The logic of the standpoint, identifying standpoints, third, controversies, limits, and revisionings, fourth, and last, modern or postmodern, natural or only social sciences. Select theorists and essays from Harding's edited volume, The Feminist Standpoint Theory Reader, Dorothy E. Smith, her essay, Women's Perspective as a Radical Critique of Society, Bell Hooks, she chooses the margin as a space of radical openness. Patricia Hill Collins, learning from the outsider within the sociological significance of the black feminist thought. And uh, their other uh, important works uh, are highlighted uh, in purple color. These are uh, their famous books uh, authored by them. Then the next theorist is Kathy Weeks. Her essay, Labor Standpoints and Feminist Subjects. 
Maria Mice and Vandana Shiva, The Substances Perspectives, Alison M. Jagar, Feminist Politics and Epistemology, Sara Rudik. She presents her perspectives on maternal thinking as a feminist standpoint. Donna Haraway, Situated Knowledges. Nancy C.M. Hartsock, The Feminist Standpoint, Developing a Ground for a Specifically Feminist Historical Materialism. Uma Narayan, The Project of a Feminist Epistemology, Perspectives from a Non-Western Feminist. Now I'll uh, give you a brief up of few select theorists. First one is Dorothy E. Smith, a Canadian sociologist, was the first to shape the perspective in the essay, Women's Perspective as a Radical Critique of Society. Whenever a woman presents her views, against the oppressive social structure, her views are taken as radical. They are not accepted and it needs time uh, for their views to be accepted. Smith argued that sociology has ignored and objectified women making them the other. She claimed that women's experiences are fertile grounds for feminist knowledge and that by grounding sociological work in women's everyday experiences, sociologists can ask new questions. For instance, Smith argued that because women have historically been the caregivers of the society, men have been uh, able to dedicate their energy to thinking about abstract concepts that are viewed as more valuable and important. Men can work in a unique way because they are supported by caregivers, by women. Women's activities are thus made invisible and seen as natural rather than as a part of human culture and history. If sociologists start from a female perspective, they can ask concrete questions about why women have been assigned to such activities and what the consequences are for social institutions such as education, the family, government, and the economy. Next theorist is Bell Hooks, an Afro-American scholar activist. She provides a different def definition of marginality in the essay, Choosing the Margin as a Space of Radical Openness. Hooks changed the course of feminism and paved the way for intersectional feminism. She condemns the mainstream feminist discourse and bans that feminism should not be limited to bourgeoisie white women, but must become a mass-based political movement if it is to have a transformative impact on the society. The author acquires black feminist standpoint against their exclusion when their narratives and experiences are relegated to back shelf, especially when developing feminist narratives. Hooks contemplates the role of black women in society from the slavery period and provide us the new epistemology on the subject of sexism and black female slave experience, the imperialism of patriarchy, racism, feminist issues of accountability and de- evaluation of black womenhood. Bell Hook's writings focus on intersectionality of race, capitalism, and gender, and what she describes as their ability to produce and perpetuate systems of oppression and class domination. The author presents a new definition of marginality as a site of resistance as a location of radical openness and possibility. She supports the absolute transformation of society and all its institutions for peaceful tomorrow, where there is no binary oppositions, where all are considered equal. Our next theorist is, may I have a sip of water, please? 
Patricia Hill Collins, an active American academic and sociologist whose work mainly concerns issues of involving feminism, gender, and social inequality within the Afro-American society. She coins the term outsider within the prime condition for a standpoint in the essay, Learning from the Outsider Within, the Sociological Significance of Black Feminist Thought. She discusses the lives of the women who have shifted from, Afer uh, from Africa to US for their work and how they are treated as outsider within. She explains outsider within are social locations or border spaces marking the boundaries between groups of unequal power. Individuals acquire identities as outsiders within by their placement in these locations. She argues that racial segregation in housing, education, and employment promotes group commonalities that promote the formation of a group-based collective standpoint. Collins claims that Black women cannot fully be a member of feminist thought, nor Black social thought as feminism restricts to whiteness. So they are excluded from Black movement by their men, they are excluded from feminism by white women, while black activism to maleness. Hence, the makeup of Afro-American women's identity and consequently their experiences as black women maintain their position as outsiders within spaces of operations. On the other hand, Collins observes the outsider within social location of black women provides them with a unique perspective on social, political, and intellectual and economic realities. Therefore, they can bring a more nuanced outlook to feminist and social thought. Collins proposed a form of standpoint theory that emphasized the perspective of African American women. Collins argued that the matrix of oppression an interlocking system of race, gender, and class oppression and privilege has given African-American women a distinctive point of view from which to understand their marginalized status. She showed how African-American women have been oppressed by the economic exploitation of their labor, the political denial of their rights, and the use of controlling cultural images that create damaging stereotypes and she suggested that African-American women can contribute something special to feminist scholarship. Collins called for the inclusive scholarship that rejects knowledge that dehumanizes and objectifies people. Our next theorist is Kathy Weeks, one of the Marxist feminists who is critical of Marxian constricted conception of production, which fails to recognize the possibility of a standpoint grounded in women's labor activities. She criticizes Marxist thought for only including women's labor, uh, only including men's labor. And uh, that school does not talk about the labor performed by women. Hence, they have incorporated women into an analysis of everyday life in capitalism. Kathy Weeks labor, views labor as the building block of feminist standpoint. She builds the ontology of labor in the essay, Labor Standpoints and Feminist Subjects. She discusses the alternative exploration of women's work, which can be described in terms of maternal labor, the work of rearing children, Kin work, the work of maintaining relationships among friends and extended family members, and caring labor or emotional labor or personal services. Women's labor is categorized as reproductive labor, a term coined to hold the most common forms of women's labor, gender-based household as well as wage labor. Primarily, uh, the 
labor of women the household labor of women is unpaid even if they work for wage they are mainly given the work of service providing the division between productive and reproductive labor is established productive labor results in the production of goods or services that have monetary value in the capitalist system and the producers are thus remunerated in the form of a paid paid wage reproductive labor is associated with caregiving and domestic roles while both types of labor are necessary people are assigned these forms of work based on specific aspects of their identity excuse me for a while yeah karl marx argues that labor is value creating activity which is an unstable social judgment that can be contested harding explicates the point of focusing on women's labor is to create sites of contestation over the social construction of specific constitutive practices where we can raise questions about what we can do and who we can become therefore when feminist theorist built their models of subjectivity around labor kathy argues that they attempt to break up the mechanism of and a point of entry into the larger process of opposition to this practice maria mais and vandana shiva are the next theorists they have presented the subsistence perspective and uh, this perspective is also uh, given by maria mais and veronica they situate a standpoint based on perspective from below from what is necessary if one looks at the world from this perspective all things and relations appear in a different light light for instance hillary clinton viewed from this perspective is described as by maria as poor hillary she has no cow no income of her own she has only one daughter thus the consciousness of substances perspective depends primarily not on education status money and prestige but on control over means of subsistence that is a cow some chicken children land and also some independent income these people believe empowerment can only be found in ourselves and in our cooperation with nature within and around us therefore the subsistence perspectives are the capacity of a community to produce their life without being dependent on the outside world or agents therefore these people reject this development model rural women do not need any development they are strong women what they need is that various kinds of oppressors get off their backs the concept of subsistence is usually associated with poverty and backwardness by western people excuse me in the subsistence perspective authors however want to show that subsistence not only means living at the margins of existence and hard labor but also joy in life happiness and abundance the author wants to demonstrate that there exists a different conception of economy which is both older and younger than the capitalist patriarchal one now i'll have a brief discussion from the book the outsiders within a dalit feminist standpoint in the life narratives of dalit women which will give uh, all of us a uh, idea of how to create new perspectives on the on feminist standpoints i will discuss only chapter 3 of the book that is representations of labor developing a dalit feminist standpoint in the life narratives of dalit women though uh, in this book and in many of the papers 
we all have come across and we all have discussed about the intersectional operation of caste, class and gender of Dalit women. This is something which we haven't discussed much yet. So I will uh, give you a brief idea of Dalit feminist standpoint from this chapter. The chapter examines the three life narratives of Marathi Dalit women writers. Urmila Pawar's The Weave of My Life, a Dalit women's memoir, Baby Kamle's The Prisons We Broke, and Urmila Pawar's and Minakshi Moon's We Also Made History to Explore Their Representations of the Labor Performed by Women of the Dalit Community. Now here, as I have discussed the lived experience of the group of women is important to situate their standpoint. Here I am talking about uh, Dalit women, whereas I don't belong to the community. So how to present the authentic viewpoints is I have taken their perspectives, what they have represented in their life narratives. So I'm making use of the perspectives of Dalit women as a scholar to situate a Dalit feminist standpoint. Their labor has always been unrecognized, unacknowledged and unrepresented by Dalit men and upper caste women writers and others. The chapter addresses how the caste affects their work and the changing perception of Dalit women's work with time alongside their geographic, economic and political changes. Uh, predominantly, the exploration illustrates how the writers make their labor, uh, labor as the basis for situating a Dalit feminist standpoint. Now, I quote from uh, B. Bapuji's paper, Marx and Angels, that is in 1845-46, they observed that the crude form of division of labor found among the Indians called forth the caste system in their state and religion. They criticized the idealist belief that the caste system produced a crude form of division of labor. Whereas much of the discussion, they say that caste divides the people for their labor. Whereas Marx, uh, they present that it is the crude form of the labor which gave rise to different castes. Thus, for Marx, the caste regime was also a particular division of labor. Perspectives of Karl Marx on the caste system reveal that at the center of the caste hierarchy is a division of labor, a system of power relations, which outcast the lower caste or the former untouchables, now called Dalits. They are marginalized and repressed politically and economically to ensure uh, their easy availability as workers for performing enslaved, menial, dirty, dangerous, low paying and insecure work. However, most of the information available to the readers and scholars about the Dalit community concerns male labor. For instance, Dalits have a further division into sub castes like, castes like Parias, who are the lowest and work for upper caste as bonded laborers. Kusavars make earthenware pots, Nadars climb, Palmaria palms for a living and the main occupation of Chakliar is leather concussion. Until the 1990s, there has been a paucity of literature and research on Dalit women and their work in India, which results in substantial neglect of the work they perform. Corresponding to the concept of caste hierarchy, which is a system of power relations by which the lower castes are exploited as workers, the Marxist feminist analysis reveal the notion of patriarchy a hierarchical system of power which enables men as class to have authority and power over women. So Dalit women are doubly marginalized. They are Dalit of Dalits. They are marginalized for being Dalit. They are also marginalized for being Dalit women. Nakano Glenn ex explicates that under this system, the control over women is attained and maintained by men through the sexual division of labor. Thus, it permits men to reap inconsistent benefits by placing themselves in position of authority over women. But uh, neither the concept of caste hierarchy nor the notion of patriarchy recognizes the specific location of Dalit women. The Marxist feminist analysis of women's subordination unravels two intersecting systems, capitalism and patriarchy. Unlike the Marxist analysis of class exploitation, Marxist feminist 
give equal importance to patriarchy and argue that it has been established and is sustained on the basis of sexual division of labor. Through the sexual division of labor, women are, their choices are limited and their development is controlled. They are subjugated. Men have been the wage laborers or bread earners, while women have been assigned virtually exclusive responsibility for private affairs or household consumption and reproduction. The culture of domesticity venerates the women as the center of home and hearth, but this idea of separate spheres does not apply to Dalit women. That is what comes out through their perspectives. They work round the clock, grinding between the household work and the field work with their men. However, their labor, labor is uncomprehended and unrepresented by Dalit men and mainstream feminist writers. Therefore, Dalit women's performed labor is recognized as we can know a thing only through its representations. Thus, Dalit women imbued with Dalit consciousness represented their perspectives of life the delineations of which show that while writing about their community and hardships, the women exhibited natural tendencies towards feminist perspectives, representations of feminine labor, the day-to-day -day struggle that is made difficult by the interlocking operations of caste, class, and gender. The following extended excerpt elucidates the daily routine of a common Dalit women. Though this is a long excerpt, but I would, write, uh, I would like to read the whole paragraph before you that depicts the grinding routine of Dalit women, which has never been represented by anyone. I quote from the text, the day began very early for women at 4 a.m. In spite of the heavy rain, they had to fetch water from the well for everybody in the house to bathe in, drink and cook food and so on. Then they cleaned the pots and plates used the previous night and cooked for whole house. They breakfasted with their men folk and went with them to work in the fields. They planted paddy till their backs broke. They had to carry lunch if the fields were far away. After lunch, they worked in the fields once again and returned home in the evening just half an hour earlier than their men. They lit their stoves under an earthen pot which they had filled up in the morning to keep the hot bath water ready for their men returning from the fields. After heating the bath water, they began preparations for the evening meals. The spices had to be pounded and grains ground. Then there was the cooking to do. Sometimes they had to even husk the rice before cooking. As they worked ceaselessly on these tasks, the men arrived, bathed and sat smoking leisurely in the veranda, some of them drinking liquor. Women would again go to the well to fetch water, wash the mudded clothes of all the people in the house, hang them out to dry, light the lamps and serve food to men first. After everybody in the house had eaten, they ate a few morsels from the leftovers. Then they had to roll out the beds for everybody. The work was still not over. After the children went to sleep, they sat down and massaged the heads and feet of their husbands with oil. By the time they lay down in bed, their back would be sent, would be bent like a bow because of the hard work. Hence, until represented, the crushing daily routine of Dalit women was neither realized nor understood by others. The depiction of their inescapable persistent labor shows that the idea of separate spheres does not apply in the case of Dalit women. The marginalized and repressed condition of the Dalit community doubled the labor of their women. They perform household work besides field work and the outside work with their men for their survival. Therefore, the position and lived experiences of Dalit women are fundamentally different from that of Dalit men.
the representations of performed labor by dalit women situate the dalit feminist standpoint that allows the reader to understand caste hierarchies patriarchal institutions and ideologies as insistent inversions of humane social relations because labor forms one of the many mutually constitutive links between social structure and subjectivities it's stated by kathy weeks hence it has been used as the building block in the formation of the feminist standpoint theory by many marxist and socialist feminists such as nancy hartsock in 2004 all these essays they are mentioned in harding's volume kathy weeks silvia pedrisi and many others analysis of dalit women's life activities illustrate that dalit women's work differs systematically from dalit men's and upper caste women's thus their repression is maintained as a result of the work assigned to them as dalit women took up a different position in the system of caste and class operation the exploration of the select text elucidates the following four main categories of labor performed by women first household work second work for survival third labor of biological reproduction and motherhood fourth intellectual and political labor household work the dalit community has an obvious uh, gender division of labor that engages women in the various household activities like cleaning washing bringing water from the river cooking managing the raw materials taking care of the family members fulfilling their needs and so forth that is why they gave they have a common saying i quote pavar the family can be strong if the women's waist is strong unquote which indicates that dalit women are the center of the dalit family structure despite this women's everyday work is unrecognized and taken for granted cooking and related activities cooking is the indispensable household activity i am discussing these minor activities because that is what checks the development of women that checks uh, developing they are developing to their full potential that uh, makes many of the girls to drop out from the schools because they feel that at the end of the day they will be performing all such activities so survival activities and household activities are more important for them cooking and related activities cooking is the indispensable household activity of women representations of culinary skills and meal times draw a picture of the moral economy of the dalit community daily meals constitute rice cooked from coarse grains gravy of lentils or leafy vegetables bhakri that is a low quality uh, bread etc but special dishes are made from rice flour for important occasions like uh, gharge modak kheer uh, bhenor puri etc i quote pavar folding the puri into petal like shapes to be joined at the end like a crown without spilling the filling inside is an art by itself it is not an easy dish but i had mastered the art unquote the cooking activities are very demanding in terms of time skill and attention and dalit women invest much hard work in cooking and its preparations but this work is considered feminine taken for granted benston says housework is the most unproductive the most savage and the most arduous work a women can do it is exceptionally petty and does not include anything that would in any way promote the development of the woman moreover the economic deprivation of the community increases the intricacies of gendered work performed by their women for example after catching fish women sort out small fish dry days poor women store the water in which fish have been boiled the stock is boiled till it becomes sauce like thick and is then stored in bottles this is called cart when men folk are not at home the women and girls dine 
only on cart they make soup with this this consistently upsets their stomach though there are many other activities but i have to adhere to the given time uh, their next activity is caring renewal and socialization of families caring renewal and socialization of families is another essential category of household work that dalit women perform in the dalit community women besides cooking cleaning washing activities attempt to strengthen their pride in their cultural roots a way of instilling self respect and renewal of spirits they need renewal of spirits as uh, dalit community is the most oppressed they make preparations for the dalit women make preparations for the celebration of festivals such as dasara diwali nagpanchmi gauri and ganpati festival and rituals of the month of ashad which corresponds to june july pawar discusses that the time of dasara has a very festive atmosphere the gudi or decorated pole is erected by akka or sister at the door and is decorated with flowers and sugar rings which all children enjoy instilling self respect and renewal of spirits they make preparations for the celebrations of festivals the descriptions made by kamble show that the month of ashad is a reviving and is the favorite month of the dalit community i quote from the text this one month of happiness developed in their hearts an iron will endure whatever suffering came their way during the remaining 11 months so the rejuvenation revival of the community that is the labor performed by dalit women then work for survival it includes the labor performed for their livelihood a set of ex- activities essential to daily life such work includes gathering food fodder firewood and other natural things for securing life and shelter as majority of them they are economically deprived exploration of select texts primarily the prisons we broke and the weave of my life illustrates that the livelihood activities are performed by poverty stricken women of the dalit community to fulfill the basic needs of their households as in the dalit community running the household is the responsibility of women uh, the representations show that many men they spend their money in drinking and gambling representations of the writers show that many a times women run the risk of sexual harassment sexual exploitation and even life threat during these activities i quote pawar they get to the creek they thrust their hands into the sand to collect the variety of fish there when they thrust their hands into the sand to collect a variety of fish their nails often got pulled apart from the flesh their fingers often got blooded and their backs ached with the strain of constant bending unquote then the labor of motherhood the exploration of the text shows that central to the experience of mothers and mothering is a poignant combination of power and powerlessness it's a combination of power because it's uh, the main requirement of a women to have a child in all the communities i should say and why it is powerlessness most women have mothered in conditions of social violence and economic deprivation governed by men the majority of dalit women are in a state of repression poverty ignorance and lack of consciousness to change their circumstances they lack the necessary facilities and awareness of their bodies kamble discusses a meher women would continue to give birth till she reached menopause hardly a few of the babies would survive many a time they too were given away in the service of village because in a dalit com- uh, community they have a culture of uh, dedicating their elder son to the community as a poot raja and uh, 
the girls are also uh, dedicated as muralis the author also gave birth to 11 children of whom three died during childhood pawar's mother gives a one word definition of motherhood sacrifice she states i quote to be a mother is to commit sati then the most important labor uh, performed by dalit women is intellectual and political labor the writings of dalit women are testimonies to the hardships of the dalit community primarily their women dalit women writers are not born writers and do not write for aesthetics they make the political use of their memory and representation and represent their perspectives which pave the way for situating a dalit feminist standpoint uh dr bhushan sharma was able to situate a dalit feminist standpoint in her book because of the representations made by dalit women in their writings so they have their uh, intellectual labor which they have performed is prime their movement from the marginal space to dominant social structures provide them with double vision of the society Uh, they make creative use of their marginality and learning from their outsider within identity they represent the distinctive lived experience resulting from their performed labor and their perspectives on interlocking nature of oppression of caste class and gender which dalit women endure uh, these interlocking oppressions i have not discussed much because i am discussing only chapter 3 which relates to their labor their lived experiences as dalit women provide us with a unique perspective of the society and angle of vision concerning dalit women womanhood unavailable to other groups you can refer to chapter 2 of this book the weave records the accounts of making of feminist and the prisons besides a personal account is profoundly political and critical record of the making of nation from the vantage point of marginal social location dalit women writers make their memory a stratagem to generate dalit and feminist consciousness and inculcate the impulse for resistance in future generations i quote calmly i am writing this history for my sons daughters daughters in law and my grandchildren to show them how the community suffered because of the chains of slavery and so that they realize what ordeals of fire uh, the mehers have passed through i also want to show them what the great soul dr baba saheb ambedkar single handedly achieved which no one else had achieved in ages unquote thus the most important labor performed by dalit women is their intellectual and political labor that has been ground breaking in developing a dalit feminist standpoint also forward the cause of dalit literature dalit movement and feminism conclusion creating a feminist uh, creating a feminist standpoint is essential to make known women's collective struggle against the oppressive social structures which not only make their lives difficult but also check their development and reaching full potential harding states collective political and intellectual work can transform a source of oppression into a source of knowledge and political liberation because a distinctive contribution to social and it makes a distinctive contribution to social justice it gives rise to activism so references and further reading the seminal articles on feminist standpoint theories mentioned in this presentation and many others that is all 28 essays are collected together in hardings the feminist standpoint theory reader many are available online as they were initially published in journals you can go through them if your research is related to women studies or women's narratives and writings then you can uh, go uh, you can uh, refer to the complete book the outsiders within a dalit feminist standpoint in the life narratives of dalit women by dr bhushan sharma how a uh, uh, different perspective uh, has been added to dalit feminist standpoint by this book so these are the references thank you so much with this i end my presentation
thank you ma'am thank you very much ma'am for your presentation i hope our participants something learn new from you thank you very much ma'am thank you so much ma'am now we are proceed to our quiz competition then we come back again with our q and a okay ma'am yeah thank you thank you dear participants it's our quiz session time our quiz code is igp let's see in the our quiz video Participants, it's our quiz session time. You can join this session by slido.com and today our quiz code is IGP. You can also scan our QR code from the screen to join this session. We are start our quiz competition after one minute later. We have started our quiz competition now, so be ready. Our first question is, feminist standpoint theory mostly borrows from Mars or hell. Option number one, Mars is the right answer. Our next question is, define a standpoint theory. Is it a theory that you can only argue if you are, you are standing up or a feminist theory arguing that knowledge stems from social position? Option number two, a feminist theory arguing that knowledge stems from social position is the right answer. Our next question is, is a standpoint theory a social liberal or radical feminist theory? Is it social or liberal? Option number two, liberal is the right answer. Our next question is, standpoint theory is only focus upon feminist belief. The statement is true or false?
the statement is false our next question is the term feminist standpoint suggests taking a stand on the issues neglected by feminism or a strange society from the perspective of women option number 2 studying studying society from the perspective of women is the right answer our next question is what does standpoint theory state is it oppressed groups have a clearer view of society than dominant groups or we should only listen to our own standpoint Option number one: Oppressed group have a clearer view of society than do dominant groups. Is the right answer. Our next question is: Who is the founder of standpoint theory? Is it Stuart Hall or Sandra Harding? Option number two, Sandra Harding is the right answer. Our next question is, which one of these is not a feminist standpoint? Is it radical feminist or functionalist feminist? Option number two, functionalist feminist is the right answer. Our next question is: An informative speech about a standpoint theory is it a speech about object or concept? Option number two concept is the right answer. Our last and final question is: According to standpoint theory, this social class has the best perspective of society. Is it upper class or lower class? lower class is the right answer thank you everyone and congratulations of our top 10 quiz competition winners top 10 quiz competition winners get their quiz certificate after this session from our official facebook quiz now now we proceed to our Q&A session and after that we come back with our speaker. Let's enjoy this video.
Hello, ma'am. Thank Hello. you, ma'am, for staying in the back space. Thank you so much for inviting me to this session. Dear participants, it's our Q and A session. You can ask the question in the comment box. After Q and A, we have certification process. So participants are requested to ask their question in the comment box. Dear participants, if you have any question related to this topic, you can ask the question in the comment box. Dear participants, we are still waiting for your question. Ma'am, our first question is, how do we promote the right of feminists regardless of color, culture, and status? And the second number is, especially those women who are a victim of oppression and slavery. How do we promote the rights of feminists regardless of color, culture, and status? Especially those women who are victim of oppression and slavery. Uh, it's a, a very good question. In fact, uh, the women who are most victimized, uh, they are far from feminism. In fact, I should say the feminism has not reached to the uh, girl who is most in need. So this uh, again requires, uh, first of all, uh, women should help each other. The ones who are educated, we should try in uh, uplifting our own community, uh, enlightening them, providing them awareness, educating them. As many Dalit women organizations, for example, they have come up in many countries and uh, like India, Nepal, and uh, they are guiding their women, their community of women. They are uh, guiding them not only of the awareness, but of the minor activities to generate their income. And they, then they are helping them to join education. In India also, we have uh, free education uh, uh, for beginning. Uh, students for primary sections, then we are providing meals to the uh, children in the school so that the uh, children who are below poverty line, just because of food, they should enter the schools. So when they enter, they will definitely learn. So these kind of activities should be promoted. And there are many uh, uh, these uh, programs run by the government. Then for, <coughs> sorry, for higher uh, placements and for education and job, there are reservations for minor groups like Dalits, uh, for uh, uh, the people who are backward, backward classes and scheduled tribes. We have special uh, privileges for them. So first of all, we can bring the our problems. We can uh, we should situate our standpoint. Our standpoint highlights our uh, uh, our things that subjugates us that highlights our uh, problems and they are uh, active uh, they are uh, brought into the limelight of activists and then through them government uh, can uh, government is gets information and there are new policies being introduced for these marginalized people but again that comes a standpoint is important unless and until you are brought to the limelight the government will not reach you. So the best way is to help each other. And the major factor which restricts uh, our, uh, our development is poverty. And for poverty in India, we have many schemes uh, for poor people. The prime is education and bringing them to the uh, mainstream through educating them. 
then we have many schemes which provides loans uh, to women to start uh, their own business and minor activities uh, at home so uh, because of all this uh, we can improve the condition of the oppressed women why is standpoint theory liberal standpoint theory is liberal because a standpoint uh, it provides the knowledge of women it highlights it brings to the limelight it uh, 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 it uh, uh, it believes in the perspectives of women till now the knowledge was only androcentric men centered whereas women's problems women's issues uh, they were neglected they were sidelined so feminist standpoint theory is the perspectives of women should be taken into account they should be respected they should be uh, considered a part of knowledge and being women if uh, the knowledge is only produced by white women or by the western theorists that again uh, creates a binary among western women among white and black women among western and third world women so uh, this feminist standpoint theory should be liberal all groups of women whether from west from uh, black from third world from religious communities they should be given a chance to uh, put to represent their perspectives to situate their standpoint thank you ma'am we have no more question thank you very much ma'am for your wonderful presentation thank you so much and what is your last and final words for our audience last and final words is uh, as women though they form uh, uh, due to the binary structure they form the oppressed group they form uh, they are suppressed and marginalized but i uh, should say that and i personally believe in women should believe in their strength in their collective strength and women can achieve wonders they can uh, do wonders they can help each other not only the women community they can transform the community as a whole they can bring peace to the whole world so the main message is trust in yourself thank you ma'am thank you very much ma'am for your wonderful presentation dear participants today our program name is feminist standpoint theory and the code is igp3945 the code is igp3945 without code no one is eligible for certificate with code you can claim your certificate anytime and without an account on our website you can digit only but you can do anything functional today our program name is feminist standpoint theory and the code is igp3945 thank you everyone for attending this session i hope you learned something from this session and thank you very much stay happy and stay safe